Good morning, everyone. My name is Carmen Spencer, and I want to take the opportunity to welcome you to this worship service at Emmanuel Baptist Church in Willowdale, Toronto. Wherever you are watching from today, I invite you to participate in this service and pray that you will feel the touch of God's Spirit as you join us in worship. Let us prepare our hearts and our minds as we listen to this morning's prelude. Come, lift your voices in worship. Come, enter the presence of God with shouts of thanksgiving. Come, kneel before your creator and magnify his name because he alone is worthy. Let us pray. Help us to walk by faith, O Lord, and not by sight. Open our hearts to see the kingdom of God like a mustard seed. Though it begins as a tiny seed, we know that it will take root and become a very large plant in the garden, where even the birds will find refuge. And so we approach this service today with open hearts and open minds, expectantly waiting to hear a word from your mouth. Speak, for your servants are listening. Amen. Here. 
Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sun comes up, it's a new day dawn. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship His holy name. heart is kind for all your goodness I will keep on singing ten thousand reasons for my heart to find bless the Lord oh my soul oh my soul Worship His holy name Sing like never before Oh my soul I worship His holy Boys and girls, Miss Jan here. Well, here we are in June, 
and we have a little bit more freedom as of this weekend. I hope that you're able to get outside and enjoy the parks and the splash pads and things that are open. And we know that we have hope for the future as things continue to open more and more. So let me pray for you that you have a good week and that the next few weeks of school go well for you. And we'll see you hopefully one day soon. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I ask that you keep your hand upon these children as they continue to finish the school year online. I pray that this weekend brings them lots of joy and sunshine and play and that you keep them safe and healthy and that the summer holds lots of fun for them, Lord. We pray this in your name. Amen. All right. Have a good weekend, everybody. Good morning, everyone. Today I'll be reading from the book of Mark, chapter 4, verses 26 to 34. He also said, This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground, night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up. The seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it, because the harvest has come. Again he said, What shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants, with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them, as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable, but when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. Amen. How do you stay organized? Through more than three decades of ministry, I have tried to learn how to become more efficient in managing my calendar and to-do list. I have tried many different approaches over the years, from simple wall calendars to high-tech tools like Google Workspaces that I use today. I wonder if any of you are old enough to remember the daytimer system. That was state of the art at one time. And I remember one, <laughs> one time in the early 90s when uh, instead of just a printed booklet, the daytimer switched to a loose leaf binder and I could print pages from my computer that had all my appointments in it in the binder and then I could take it with me. Soon after ad adopting this system, I ran into a bit of a snag though. We were leaving church one Sunday, and I had my infant son in one arm, and I had my day timer in the other. And so as I went to put my son in his car seat, I placed the day timer on the roof of the car and locked him into place, and very soon we were driving away, and I was blissfully unaware that I had forgotten the day timer on top of the car. Have you ever driven away with something on the roof of the car? A cup of coffee, perhaps? A book? A laptop? I think most of us have done that at least once. Well, that day timer showed remarkable aerodynamic efficiency for the first little while until we came to the first intersection and we turned to the right and I heard the sound of it sliding off the roof and I knew right away what had happened. So immediately I pulled over to the side of the road and jumped out of the car to pick it up and it took me a minute to really absorb the scene. This binder, as soon as it hit the ground, it popped open and pages were flying everywhere. And you know where it was? It was on Bayview Avenue, right at the main intersection, the, the main entrance of Sunnybrook Hospital. It's a busy intersection. And there was my whole life scattered everywhere in this intersection. For the next five minutes, I dodged traffic as I ran around scooping up pages uh, as many as I could save from oblivion. 
I have an uncomfortable relationship with time management because my brain just doesn't cope with dozens of to-do items every day. And it has, it has been a career-long obsession of mine to learn and grow in order to improve my capacity for staying on track. Have I found the ultimate time management system yet? No, I wouldn't say so. But I have learned many lessons over the years, and I've made many improvements. You know, this is how we learn, typically, as human beings. We try to figure out, on our, figure out our own learning style. Then we invest time and effort to learn within that style. And then we apply what we learn, and growth occurs. In short, we grow when we apply ourselves and work at it. In some cases, we need to work very hard to achieve significant growth, but the effort is worth it in the end. Now, today's passage of scripture is about growth. But instead of learning a new skill, this passage of scripture teaches us about spiritual growth in the kingdom of God. And just as we learned last Sunday that the kingdom of God challenges us to start thinking differently, Today, Jesus teaches us about growing differently. It begins with these words. This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Well, we know that Jesus taught using objects and experiences that were taken from day-to-day experiences of his listeners, like farming was a, a common theme. And earlier in Mark's gospel, he records the more familiar parable of the sower, where Jesus goes into detail about where the seed falls, in the weeds, in rocky soil, along the path, and some fell in the good soil. But in this parable, the parable of the seed, it's only in Mark's gospel. And this one is less about the context of where the seed lands, focusing instead on the process of growth as a lifeless seed sprouts and grows to maturity and yields a harvest. Remembering that the kingdom of God really means the reign or the rule of God on earth, the day when God's will will be done as perfectly on earth as it is in heaven, this parable is rich with image and metaphor concerning the great mystery of how the kingdom of God grows. So let's read through this short parable and glean what we can about God's kingdom that is at work in the human heart. The first thing is perhaps the most important thing. It's the role of the farmer. After scattering the seed, everything else happens on its own. Verse 27, night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain. The emphasis is not on what the farmer does, but rather what the farmer does not do. He does not cause the seed to sprout and grow. Quite the opposite. The seed sprouts and grow, though he does not know how. After sowing the seed, the seed grows all by itself. Farmers can plant the seed. They know enough to plant the seeds in a place where they are more likely to grow and flourish. But ultimately, the seed grows all by itself. So when we consider growth in the kingdom of God, it is a reminder that behind all of the spiritual growth, God's power and God's will are always behind it all. I think many of you will know this from your personal experience. You come to church on Sunday morning, you approach the service with a sense of prayerful expectancy. You engage in the various parts of the service, the call to worship, the singing of praise, listening to the word of God and and the preaching of God's word, and so on and so forth. And what happens? My hope and prayer 
is that most Sundays you will leave the church refreshed and encouraged. You've been given food for thought. You felt God lift you up and you're prepared to go out into the week ahead. But let's be honest, there are also some Sundays when you participate in worship, but at the end of the service, you may feel, I don't know, uninspired, perhaps like God is distant. We all go through dry spells from time to time, whether it's because of our own circumstances or personal struggles or just because. But then there are other times when we're here in church or maybe reading scripture or in a Bible study with friends and something happens. Sometimes something dramatic happens. Perhaps the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin and you're overwhelmed and you weep and repent. Perhaps you're transported into an experience of praise and worship that just makes you feel like you could almost explode with joy and delight. Perhaps you're drifting off in your, in your thoughts and somehow God leads your mind to think about some great idea or a new insight. Perhaps God may bring a person to mind as you're sitting in church. And after the service, you call them and you check in and they tell you that they really needed a call that day. You realize that God had prompted you to reach out to that person. Sometimes dramatic things like this can happen in a service of worship. But for most of us, there is this sense that we've been in the presence of God and the fellowship of God's people, and that's enough because it strengthens our faith. The important thing is, just as seeds growth is beyond our knowledge and beyond our control, so too God's growth happens in God's timing according to his plan and his purposes. We live in a nation that celebrates hard work, entrepreneurship, and personal achievement. And so it seems counterintuitive for us to say this, but you can't work your way to spiritual growth. Only God's spirit can bring about true growth in us. An agricultural school in Iowa did a study a number of years ago on the resources needed to grow an acre of corn. They found that it required 480,000 gallons of water, that's 1.8 million liters, 6,800 pounds of oxygen, 5,200 pounds of carbon, 160 pounds of nitrogen, 125 pounds of potassium, and several other elements. In addition to all of this, it required rain and sunshine at, uh, me in measured amounts. And although that acre of land also requires a great deal of work on the part of the farmer, the study concluded that only 5% of the crop's production could be attributed to the farmer's hard work. And so we hear these words from Jesus, all by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. You know, we grow in different ways, physically through exercise, intellectually through studying, emotionally through healthy self-care, but spiritually we grow differently, not through our own determined effort, but through God's mysterious work in us. However, this is not to say we have absolutely no role to play in creating the con conditions for growth. If we skip church, if we avoid Bible study, if we become too distracted in life to pray, this is the equivalent of planting seed in unproductive soil without fertilizer or water or sunshine. Instead of thinking that we don't contribute anything to our spiritual growth at all, the more important message is that we can't ever take credit for it. Spiritual growth is always God's work in us. Think about vitamin D. You know the best source of vitamin D is natural sunlight. It's healthy to get outside and get some sunshine on your skin. But we could never take credit for that and say, 
I just went outside and produced some vitamin D. No, actually, UVB rays from the sun caused vitamin D synthesis to occur in your skin. You didn't actually produce anything. You just put yourself in the sunshine. <laughs> as I was reflecting on this, I thought about the prayer training this past year as an excellent example of God at work when people position themselves to experience his growth. From the testimonies of those who received the prayer training, the focus was not on how to use particular words when praying or a technique for making specific prayer requests. Rather, it was training in order to wait and listen to hear the voice of Jesus. When one of the people in the group felt that Jesus had given them an image, a word, or some kind of nudge in a particular direction, the group would pray into that area. And it was powerful and life-changing. Growing differently means recognizing we can prepare the soil and water the seed, but ultimately only God is able to give the growth. But here's the best part. Not only does God give the growth, but the parable also promises that spiritual growth is relentless and inevitable. Verse 28, all by itself, the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. Like a seed, once our faith germinates and begins to grow, it continues to grow and develop until it produces a harvest. This is very important for us to remember because sometimes we can pre perceive the pace of spiritual growth to be so slow that we can become discouraged. Maybe it's not happening, we think. I can't see any change taking place. Now, if you've ever wondered that about the slow pace of spiritual growth, this parable reminds us that change can be almost imperceptible, but that does not mean it isn't happening. You know, if, if you sit in your backyard and try to watch the grass grow, you're not going to see a lot of action. The rate of growth is measured in days or even weeks, not hours or minutes. Just because you can't observe it in real time doesn't mean it's not happening. Now, there are many examples of this in other areas of life. Just think, for example, about children. When you watch your own children grow, you are with them day by day, and the growth is gradual and imperceptible. You have to measure them in the doorframe every year at their birthday so you can keep track of their growth. But if you have a niece or nephew that you don't see regularly, every time you do see them, the reaction is often, wow, look how much you've grown. Just wait till we all return to in-person worship services. We will all be amazed when we see how much the children and the teenagers in our congregation have grown over the past year and a half. This growth may be almost imperceptible, but it is steady. The other thing that this parable tells us about spiritual growth is that it continues relentlessly, night and day. Whether we are waking or sleeping, the plant continues to grow, and so do we. We cannot make spiritual growth happen, but thank God that we are the beneficiaries of spiritual growth in his timing. When you continue to walk in faith and trust him, God will continue his relentless work in you. Sometimes people long to recreate the circumstances when they first experience that euphoric sense of God's spirit at work in them, that quote-unquote mountaintop experience. And through God's grace and mercy, there may be times when this happens, and it is thrilling when we have those kinds of experiences. But like the tortoise and the hare, we all know that slow and steady wins the race. In the, in the case of the kingdom of God, this is certainly true. In the long run, steady 
growth will always outpace quick growth that happens in fits and starts. The great Bible scholar William Barclay wrote this, We are creatures of the moment, and inevitably we think in terms of the moment. God has all eternity in which to work. A thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, or like a watch in the night. Psalm 90, verse 4. Instead of our petulant, fretful, irritable human hastiness, we should cultivate in our souls the patience which has learned to wait on God. James Garfield, before he held the office of the President of the United States, was principal of Hiram College in Ohio for many years. One time, a student's father asked him if he could shorten his son's studies so that he could graduate sooner. Certainly, Garfield replied, but it all depends on what you want to make of your son. You know, when God wants to make an oak tree, he takes a hundred years. When he wants to make a squash, it only requires two months. <laughs> In the kingdom of God, we grow differently. Once God's life is born in you through faith, he will see it through to its conclusion. The Holy Spirit will continue working in you and gradually, sometimes imperceptibly, but relentlessly. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. These words are a great comfort for us because all of us who are serious about spiritual growth want this process to continue. So we don't need to fret or worry about whether or not God is at work in our lives. He is. Carry on trusting him. Keep walking with him. Draw near to him. And as you do, the seed of faith planted in you will grow.
Dear Heavenly Father, we give thanks for this new day that brings with it new hope for us. Lord, you're faithful, gracious, and marvelous, and we bless and praise your holy name. Help us today to focus our mind on things above, not at things of this world that direct our attention away from you because without you we are like branches that withered away from the main vine. We want to give praise and honor to you for the wisdom and knowledge that you have bestowed on mankind to do your will. We thank you for the scientists that you have given knowledge to formulate the vaccine that can provide a level of protection for your people during these difficult times of the pandemic. Your grace, mercy, and love is sufficient. We praise your superpower. Our Father, we pray for all the people of the world. But most of all, we say a special prayer for the indigenous people who have been dealt so much in justice, your God of heaven and earth and all people. You made us all. We know that you're God of justice. So we place all of their problems into your hands and pray, dear God, that you will give them strength, faith, and help their hearts, O oh God, never to get disillusion. Give them peace, O oh God. We pray for the family of the Muslim's family who was killed because we are unable to love and tolerate each other. Keep us, help us to know that love covers a multitude of sins. Help us to be loving, caring, and kind to each other, regardless of our color, race, and religion. Give love and compassion for others. We place our own church family who has lost loved ones into your loving and caring arms. We think of Dave and Judy Longnecker who has lost their father, Karen Chung, who has lost a brother and many more in our church family who has lost a family member and loved ones during this trying and difficult time. Wrap your loving arms around them and give peace and comfort to their hearts. We pray for those in our church family who are sick, those who are alone and lonely. Father, let your holy presence be felt among them. Heal those that are sick. And help them to know, Lord, that you will never leave or forsake because you are their source and their strength. We lift up all the leaders in our church community that made it possible for us to continue worshiping and serving and blessing you during these times of the pandemic. Thank you for the technology and the people you have gifted to do your will. 
We pray for all our leaders, our own prime minister, premier, mayors. Father, we know that they must be so overwhelmed with the task of controlling and keeping everyone safe from the virus. Help them each day to ask for direction and guidance and to have faith that you are able. Lord, let them know that people are standing in the gap, praying and lifting them up in faith. We lift up all our children and their needs. In our church community and beyond. Father, you know all their needs. That they're enduring so much. Not being able to go to school, meet with friends, and all the normal things that they used to do. Father God, we pray for patience for the, the family who cares for them. And for those caregivers who care. Give them faith and give them patience, Lord, to endure. Be with all the young leaders who have to keep them engaged. Inspire the young leaders to continue doing your work. And may your blessing be theirs. You know all of our needs so we pray that what we fail to ask, that you will not fail to grant us, Lord. Today, help us not to be led into temptation, but deliver us from all the evil that surround us. For thine is your great kingdom, your power and your glory. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers. We ask these in your holy name. Amen. Morning, Emmanuel. We are so thankful for your generosity in supporting our church. There are several ways that you can send in your offerings. You can give your offering online. There's more information on how to do that on our website. You can also drop off your offering in the church mail slot, or you can send it in the mail as well. Join me as I pray for our offering and for our ministries. God, thank you so much for everything that you've done for us. Thank you for the great weather, for the ministries that we have, the opportunities to encourage and want and be there for one another. We pray that you bless our offerings and our ministries and our church community as we try to serve you and build your kingdom, Lord. We pray that you be with our volunteers, with our families, with our staff, and with everyone that's involved. We pray for our community. We pray that we would continue to grow and flourish. God, thank you for all, providing for all of our needs, and we pray that you continue to do that. In your name we pray.
Morning, Emmanuel. We are so happy that you joined us today. These are our opportunities for this Sunday. If you have youth in grades 6 to 12, they are invited to join us on Sundays at 3 p.m. on Zoom. We are starting a new series on the Book of Mark. We hope to see your youth there. Registration for Camp on the Block is now open. We'll be doing four weeks of camp online throughout the month of July with the possibility of potentially doing something in person as well, depending on the government's regulations. Our theme this year is protected. More information on cost, dates, and registration forms can be found at emmanuelbaptist.ca. We would love to see your kids there. We also wanna let you know that the church office will be closed for the month of July. If you have an urgent need, you can leave a message at the church phone. The phone number is 416-494-3155, which will be checked regularly. If your message is not urgent, someone will reply in August when the church office reopens. We would also like to let the men know that Right Now Media will be hosting a men's conference on August 20th. If you'd like more information about that and are interested, please go to rightnowmensconference.org. This is our benediction for today. May we continue to grow in our faith and deepen our roots in God. May we have faith like a mustard seed. May we see God's kingdom grow and blossom as we serve, finish school, work, rest, and be with our families. May we trust that God is at work in our lives and in others. Bless us as we head out and live a life missionally. Amen.